The 1997 Formula One Championship was one of the more odd seasons on record, for a number of reasons. First, there was a strange lineup change at the beginning of the year, with Williams dropping the reigning world champion Damon Hill for Heinz Harold Frinson. The driver champion that year was Jacques Villeneuve, who some consider undeserving given that he would not win a Grand Prix following that season until his retirement in 2006. Another strange thing was, during the final round at the European Grand Prix in Hereft, three cars registered the exact same qualifying time, with Schumacher, Frinson, and Villeneuve all posting a 121.072 in what was a seriously bizarre qualifying session. And most controversially, Michael Schumacher would be disqualified from the championship at that same race in Hereth, following what was determined to be causing an avoidable accident. The Michael turned into his championship rival in the latter half of that race, with what some saw as the intent to damage Villeneuve's Williams and force him to retire, thereby clinching the championship for himself. Of course, as karma would have it, the German was forced to retire as a result of the collision and Villeneuve went on to finish the race and win the title. But what I'm most interested about that season is something outside the main storyline of Villeneuve v Schumacher. What I'm interested in is a funny little piece of work that McLaren had put on their car in the second half of the season. It had a great name and a great story. The Fiddle Break. At the Austrian Grand Prix that year, fans and teams started to notice something funny about the McLarens. The car's brakes were uncharacteristically glowing orange in the middle of corners. Usually, drivers aren't braking in the middle of a turn, at least not if they want to be going any faster. One eagle-eyed photographer took note of this anomaly and developed a theory. A theory he would prove after looking at his images from the next round at the Nürburgring, the Luxembourg Grand Prix. And yes, everyone was well aware that the Nürburgring is not in Luxembourg, that was just a ploy to get two German races. Anyways, that eagle-eyed photographer, Darren Heath, had developed his shots from the Austrian Grand Prix and got a better look at the glowing brake discs of the McLarens. He and his editor at F1 Racing Magazine, Matt Bishop, sat down together and pondered possible explanations for the glowing brakes. His theory was that McLaren had installed a second brake pedal in the cockpit, and he wanted to get a shot inside the footwell. Photographers, of course, weren't allowed to go sticking their cameras wherever they wanted on the car, especially if a team was hiding a secret, so he had to be sneaky. And here's what he did. At the next Grand Prix, Heath had arranged for Bishop to call him if either of the McLarens were forced to retire, in order to share where it was parked up. As luck would have it, both McLarens would retire and pull up on the start-finish line within one lap of each other. Heath was on site, and he went about shoving his camera in the cockpit of a stranded McLaren and fired away. The pictures were developed, and Heath's theory was proven, for what he saw were three pedals. Mika Hakkinen had opted to have the clutches on his steering wheel, so that third pedal could have only been a second brake pedal. The triumphant journalist at F1 Racing Magazine plastered the images all over the next issue, and the secret was out. Ron Dennis was furious, and rivals were scrambling to figure out what McLaren were up to, whether it was legal, and how to copy it. Here's what the fiddle break was all about. The name Fiddle Break, by the way, would be coined by Ross Braun years later. McLaren referred to their system as Brake Steer. Anyways, the second brake pedal allowed the rear brakes to operate on either the left or right side only, providing a clear benefit under acceleration in the corners, and an instant lap time advantage. The concept first came to McLaren Chief Engineer Steve Nichols in 1996, while laying in a bath at his parents' house over Christmas break just as most Eureka moments come to F1 engineers. As Nichols recalls, McLaren had set up their cars for quite a lot of understeer. At the time, the regulations had really skinny rear tires and meaty front tires, so he has the idea to individually break the rear tires in the corners to dial out the understeer. The team just added an extra master cylinder to the car, along with a second, smaller brake pedal that was routed to just one of the rear brakes, and voila! McLaren engineers were confident that the regulations allowed for this system. At the time, electronic driver aids like traction control and launch control were banned, so the system could not be electronically driven. Since the team would only select one wheel for the brake to act on for each race, and the driver was physically pushing the pedal, they felt like they were in the clear. The drivers and engineers were delighted with the results from their brake steer system. It did a fantastic job. 
The driver would use the normal brake to slow down the car enough and then use the fiddle brake just to balance the car through high speed corners where they'd usually have understeer. It was a beautiful, simple solution. Now, moving back to the secret being revealed following the Luxembourg Grand Prix, the FIA actually decided that brake steering was legal, and McLaren continued racing with the system through the end of the season. That changed though in the following year. You see, other than the images released by the F1 racing journalists, the other teams were in the dark as to just how McLaren was implementing the system. They were busy submitting their own proposals to the FIA to test the legality of their own systems, while concurrently petitioning to ban the McLaren system. Williams had proposed a concept that would utilize an electronic system that would turn off all the brakes in corners except, say, the right rear to control over or understeer, but it was shot down on safety grounds. What didn't help McLaren's case was the first Grand Prix of the 1998 season in Australia, where the two cars lapped everyone else in the race. After that, the FIA stepped in and banned the fiddle brake on the basis that it was four-wheel steering, even though the rear wheels were obviously not being realigned. Perhaps the name brake steer was a bad choice on their part. But while it was a blow to lose their brake steering innovation, the team was no worse for wear and they went on to win the Constructors' Championship that year and in 1999. Braking through corners was actually used across a few different motorsports. In the 1989 IMSA GTO series, Hans Stuck had a method of using the brake to modulate the speed of his all-wheel drive turbo Audi on the exit of corners. This kept the huge turbo spooled up throughout the corner and rocketed him onto the straightaways. Here he is, describing his method. Meanwhile, Hans Stuck, one of the fastest men in the world in a rear-wheel drive race car, was still struggling to come to grips with the all-wheel drive system. Sooner or later, I thought, I have to win a race. Audi is paying me a lot of money, so I look like a fool. I gotta win a race now. Suddenly, he figured it all out and went on a tear. First place Cleveland, first place Brainerd, a victory at the Meadowlands. His secret? It's a left foot braking. You have this turbo lag, you know. When you go off the throttle and you go back on again, it takes a little while before the turbine builds up some pressure. So on these sort of chicanes where you don't have to shift down, I go on the brake with the left foot and stay on the throttle with the right foot. So I still have my boost pressure. And then when I leave the brake off, the car moves forward like a skyrocket. That's what it's all about. And by the way, Hans Stuck is a great racing car driver name. This egregiously long intro story about the fiddle brake brings us to the topic of this episode. Motorsport is rife with all kinds of terminology for different innovations, techniques, and so on. And in this episode, I wanted to pour over a few of my favorites. Some that you may have heard of, and some that may be new. Stick around as we talk about just what exactly barge boards do, some driving techniques, and what tire graining is. This is Garage Easter Radio. Thanks for tuning in. stood on everything, locked up his tyres, got the line, and he's back into second position on the last lap but one, and the French crowd are very happy. So we've broken up the episode into a couple of sections, and I'd like to begin with some terms about tires. Tire terms. Wheel words. Degradation designate... Uh, okay, moving on. First up is graining. You may have heard drivers come on the team radio to complain about tire graining. This is different from straight up tire wear and can have a serious effect on driver pace. When a car slides across the track, for instance due to oversteer or understeer, the tires can have little bits of rubber break away from the body of the tire. These little grains then stick to the tire and effectively separate the main body of the tire from the track. 
And when I mean little, I mean it. They are little grains the size of ball bearings, and they have the same effect on the feel for the car, reducing the grip and possibly causing the car to slide even more. That generates more graining, causing the tire to slide. You get the picture. To get rid of graining will require more careful driving, which means slower driving. Continuing to slide though will mean the driver will have to come in for a pit stop and fit new tires altogether. Oftentimes, graining will affect a driver when they have a harder compound tire fitted and struggle to keep heat in those tires due to changing track conditions or being stuck behind another car. It's important to know that graining happens when a tire is below the optimal working temperature. When a tire is above the optimal working temperature, what happens is called blistering. Blistering essentially has the same effect on driving performance, but has different symptoms. When a driver is going too hard on the tires or is driving on too soft a compound for the track conditions, they can suffer from tire blistering. This is literally when the rubber on the tire gets so hot, it bubbles up to look like a blister. All of that hot rubber reduces grip and makes it feel like the tires aren't doing their job. Tire companies actually chemically treat their tires to resist blistering, but it still happens. Blistering usually occurs on the inside of the tires, which, thanks to negative camber, has the highest loads put through it. As temperatures move north of the working range, pockets of air within the tire's rubber closest to the carcass begin to expand, begin to expand, and separate the actual usable compound from the carcass. Eventually, this makes the wheel throw off little bits of rubber. As with graining, blistering can end up being a vicious cycle if it's not controlled for by the driver slowing their pace. But what about those little bits of rubber that are flung off the tires during the race? You've heard about these before, and they're called marbles. Marbles are the globs of rubber thrown off the tires that accumulate off the racing line. You've heard every commentator talk about these, and when a car runs over them, it compromises the grip of their tires. They have the same effect as graining, except they're much larger. Lucky for drivers, marbles can be flung off the tires after just a few laps of running. And just a side note, if you ever have the opportunity to walk on a track after a race, you can pick up any of the marbles that the drivers didn't grab on their cooldown lap. It's really cool to see just how squishy the rubber is. It almost feels like Play-Doh or a stiff bread dough. It's fun to fidget around with. Now let's move on to a few air devices that have some great names. One of my favorite air device names is the barge board. It sounds like a piece of bodywork that is attached to the outside of the wheels and allows drivers to punt each other around the track and barge through traffic. Uh, unfortunately for me and Danny Kvyat, these aren't allowed, and barge boards are actually situated inside the wheels of the car. These curved vertical planes are attached to the floor just behind the front wheels and in front of the side pods. Further up are the cousins of the barge boards, which are attached to the chassis and hang in between the front tires, called turning vanes. These two devices came into development in the mid-1990s and were originally used just to condition the airflow entering the side pods. But as they evolved, they've taken on a bigger role. The barge boards act primarily as flow conditioners, smoothing and redirecting the turbulent or dirty air in the wake of the front wing, the front suspension links, and the rotating front wheels. They work with the air from the front wing and direct the turbulent wakes of the front wheels away from downstream aerodynamic surfaces. In this capacity, they separate different components of this mixture of flows and direct them either outside and around the side pads or towards the radiator inlets. The funny thing about aerodynamics on open-wheeled cars is that so much of the work in that department goes to fixing the issues that come from being an open-wheeled car. Exposed spinning wheels and suspension bits keep designers busy. Barge boards have seen a lot of development in the 2017 F1 cars, and there are a lot of crazy complex shapes and features on them. If you're more of a visual person, we'll have some images on our Instagram page the week following this episode, so be sure to check those out. A big reason there's more development being put into these guys is thanks to another job they have. That's their role as vortex generators. The vortices they shed around the side pods aid in sealing the underbody of the car, which improves diffuser performance. And that's important as the underbody and diffuser generate a large portion of the car's downforce. Another favorite air device term of mine is the tire squirt slots. While they sound like a device that would spray some kind of liquid on the tires in order to cool them down, and that's actually a great idea someone needs to look into, 
There, another way designers get around the issues of having an open-wheeled car. Tire squirt is the effect of rear tires splitting the airflow under the car and throwing low-pressure air into the diffuser. That makes the diffuser produce less downforce, so in order to combat this, you'll notice a number of slits, slots, and holes in the floor of the car directly in front of the rear wheels. These move the high-pressure air on top of the floor underneath to seal the inside of the rear tire from that disturbing wake, therefore sealing the diffuser. These little slots first started appearing on cars in 2009 and have been a point of development ever since then. My favorite thing about these little aero features is that they underpin how intricate these cars are. Looking at the car as a whole, obviously it's built for pure speed and function, and all the little details that appear the more and more you look at pictures are there for a reason. These little squirt slots may seem insignificant, but they show just how close to the limit these cars are designed. That may seem obvious to say, but I've said it nonetheless. There are so many more aerodynamic terms to cover, but those are just two devices I wanted to look at. Let's move on to a few driving terms you may have heard talked about during race broadcasts. First up is a technique called trail braking. When racers approach a corner, the approach is generally hard on the brakes to slow down, then off the brakes as you turn into the corner and start to ease on the throttle as you hit the apex or shortly thereafter. In race cars that don't have an analog brake system or stability control, it's important that the braking of the car is done in a straight line. If the wheels are turned when the driver puts his foot hard down on the brake, it's much easier to lock up the front wheels and miss the apex. This style of braking in a straight line is not always optimal though. See, having to coast through a corner with no inputs on the throttle or brake pedal can mean you're losing time. It means you probably could have braked later. Advanced drivers employ a technique called trail braking. Let's say a car is going through a corner and the driver has to brake at the 100 meter board. He gets the car slowed down enough to make the corner and then begins to turn the wheel at around the 10 meter board. Hitting the apex, he's back on the throttle and on his way. A trail braking driver can hit the brakes later, say at the 90 meter board. And instead of letting off the brakes before turning, he starts to ease off as he begins turning the wheels. He has to balance the braking force of his left foot with the steering input and speed in order to avoid locking up. Just as he lets off the brake, his right foot is stepping on the gas. This way, the driver has minimized the amount of time that he has to coast through the corner, and he also braked 10 meters later than the straight line breaker. Trail braking is most often used in slow corners where the braking distance is crucial, and it can make it a bit easier to manhandle the car around the corner, where in fast turns it's easier to rely on aerodynamics. The technique is used by advanced drivers who experienced balancing their hand, eye, and foot coordination, where younger drivers might struggle with translating what they're seeing into the inputs on the car. Next time you're watching an onboard view of a race or a qualifying session, try and pay attention to the driver's telemetry and see where he's coming off the brakes compared to when he's turning the wheel. You might be able to pick up on some of the best trail breakers. In F1, Lewis Hamilton is one of the most prolific, but certainly not the only. Another driving term you may have heard of is called snap oversteer. Also called liftoff oversteer, this is a form of handling that can be dangerous if uncontrolled, but it can also be used to the driver's advantage. If you've driven a car with a manual transmission or ever played around with one of the DSG paddle shifter gearboxes, you've probably felt this before. Lighting off the gas pedal starts to brake the car via engine braking, and this is especially pronounced at the higher revs. So when you're going around a bend and let off the throttle, that breaks the car and puts more weight on the front axle. This loss of weight on the rear can cause it to step out, which is really bad if you're not expecting it to. Drivers use snap oversteer in slower corners to get more weight on the front tires and rotate the car easily through the turn. That can also be tricky because downshifting mid-quarter or letting off the gas can unseat the rear too much and cause a spin. It's also a good technique for front-engine, front-wheel drive cars on corner exit to get more grip and combat understeer. This phenomenon is really popular in rallying as well, as drivers have to contend with loose surfaces that make it harder to get the front tires to bite. In consumer cars, snap oversteer was a big talking point in the 60s, as drivers were crashing cars after having this occur. It means that car manufacturers have to find the right balance of engine braking and transmission programming to make sure their customers aren't caught out. Just like a racing driver has to balance his engine braking on the track, 
albeit with a bit more at stake. Fun fact, Darren Heath, the photographer who snapped the picture that ended up exposing McLaren's fiddle break, is now the resident photographer for the McLaren F1 team. I guess expose journalism works out in the long run. That wraps up our episode on a few motorsport terms, names, and devices. I hope you enjoyed and maybe learned something new. We'll follow up with another episode talking about these types of things in the future, so if you happen to come across a great story from an oddly named innovation, or are curious what a gurney flap is, let us know. Tweet us at to Radio, and we're also on Instagram and post some neat graphics each week in relation to that week's episode. So give us a follow if you want some fresh motorsport content on your Instagram feed. See you then. Take care.